2020, I bought a, a truck, and it had no rust on it whatsoever. It was beautiful in the fall whenever I bought it. But then in the spring, rust just popped out of nowhere. You know what rust is caused from? It's called, caused from oxygen, and it's caused from moisture, and it can even be humidity. Therefore, the drier climates, the least likely they are to rust. Yes, a little bit of science this morning. Yippee. And that's caused because the protective coating and or paint and primer has pinholes in it or scratches or scrapes. If the metal was fully and completely encapsulated, it would never rust because oxygen and moisture could not get to it. But because there are hairline or, or small little chips in our vehicles, guess what? If it's not taken care of and addressed, your vehicle's going to rust in Iowa. Right? Wrong? Maybe? That's just the way it is. Welcome to Iowa. Go down to Arizona, move down there, your vehicle's most generally going to last a lot longer. But I was thinking about that. Are we not to wear the full armor of God? And what happens, or what has happened in our lives, many times there are little puncture holes. There are little things in our life. And if those things are not addressed and dealt with, dealt with guess what? It's going to cause decay. Right? And the Lord is saying this day, hey, get these things taken care of. That has been kind of the theme. That's exactly what Greg was speaking about this morning as well. Like I said, he, he spoke the message already. But the Lord is wanting us to do some cleansing. The word says, do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, make sure your protective coating is impenetrable. As I look at all that is happening in the world, especially in the United States... Evil is not hiding in the shadows any longer. It's walking right down the center of the streets. It holds office in our court, courtrooms. It parades itself in our schools. It celebrates the murder of innocent and has a, mouth, a month dedicated to it. Any place that can get a foothold, it takes up residency and exploits it. There should be a sobering mindset that good is being hunted and evil celebrated. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And when a nation celebrates pride and arrogance, regardless of what the agenda is behind it, that nation is in a critical place of bringing judgment upon itself. And so we should be in earnest prayer over our nation because as a nation we have given the devil and evil spirits a foothold, an opening to bring destruction upon ourselves. And I believe it is the prayers of the saints that is holding an awful lot back these days. I believe it is the prayers of the saints. Look through history. But you may be saying, well, this prophet said this and this prophet said that concerning the nation. My question is, where does the words of the prophets end and the judgment of God begins? You can ask yourself that. This decay that we see today has, been, has not been an overnight decay. Can we agree on that? There have been scratches, dents, and dings that have not been dealt with and repaired properly over time. The effects of negligence are fully visible. And this nation is walking in an open shame. I do not, you know, I ju just driving through town, and you know, my, my heart truly weeps with what I see. It, it truly does. I mean, think about this. 
Pride comes before a fall. And we, a whole month, pride, pride. And I'm not saying look at the agenda. Just the word alone. Giving glory to pride. Just the word. Does that not explain to us the condition of our nation? And, and we didn't, it didn't happen overnight. It's been years and years and years and years of decay and working. Because a foothold was grabbed hold of and it, it was exploited. This is not the time to be slack nor ignorant of the devices of the enemy. This is a time to be walking with open eyes and clean hearts. Pure, perfect, tried, and true. Hence, a spotless bride. This is a call to open inspection. And through this inspection, that you may guard the good deposits that has been entrusted in you. We all know this stuff, right? Good deposits are within each and every one of us. And we are to protect these things. The time for extra vigilance and awareness as a people of God is upon us. We must guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and protect the windows of our sight and ears. But not only this, but also allow an open invitation of inspections of our depths to the Lord. Is, is he not pulling on your heart? Just randomly this week, and I don't think this is my prayer, I think it's just something that he, he must, he, he, but he struck me this week. And my prayer was this, Lord, give me a clean heart or a pure heart before you and before your people. In the middle of the day, I don't even know where it came from. I don't think that was my natural thought. But I think it was a draw from him saying, be pure before me and before my people. And that's what he's calling us to. But how can we be pure if we're holding on to the old things, things that he is saying, let go of. They are weighing you down. They are besetting you. Do we trust him with our heart or just our well-being? He's saying, give me your heart. He's calling our hearts to come alive. As stated earlier, the enemy will exploit any foothold he can. Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The New Living Translation says this, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Sometimes we walk with things still attached to our ankle and they're slowing us down. And he said, no, 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 you need to run with the horses. These things are slowing you down and you can't even keep up with the footman. But I've called you to run with the horses. How can we run with the horses if the weights are around our ankles? These weights are those offenses, regrets, insecurities, fears, and doubts, undwelt with trauma and torment, bitterness and anger. Those are weights. Those are things that, that hold us down and slow us down. These things slow us down and hinder our growth and, pros and prosperity in both the spiritual and physical do, do we understand that the, these things can hinder us spiritually? Greg, there again, Greg mentioned the very thing. These things can hinder our, us spiritually. Do you also know that they can hinder your physical well-being? Ulcers and so on and so on and so forth. That these things can actually affect your body. And he's saying, hey, let go of these things. That's why I, I really cherish, especially, you know, those believers that are like in their 90s and they're still full of energy and life. It's like, man, that's an Iron Man there. 
You ever come across a believer well up in their age and they're still functioning and sharp and it's amazing. But the, yet, yet whenever I was in my 20s, I was in worse shape than I was in my, my uh, 40s walking with the Lord. It was amazing. Something changed even within my physical body. The Lord is wanting us to strip off the blankets and fortifications that we have built around our hearts and minds. I've heard this statement many times, and we've probably, every one of us has said this. And this, just because I've heard it many times, it's not directed toward one person, so don't get your ego up too big. I'm not talking about you. I've heard this statement, though. I can't get out of my mind. Anyone ever say that? Just me? Wow, no group participation today. <laughs> the reason that one can't get out of their mind is because they have not been transformed by the renewing of their minds, the washing of the mind. They have not put on the mind of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I get in my own mind once in a while too. If you see me get really quiet and <laughs> really quiet, that's because I'm in my own mind. But what is the mind of Christ? They have not put on the mind of Christ. They have not yet come to the true revelation that they are seated in heavenly places in, with Christ. They walk in a half truth. Sometimes we walk in a half truth. We have this concept that Christ is here with us, right? Yes. Right. We have this concept that Christ is here with us. He walks with us and he talks with us. Gail was wanting to know if I was going to sing. He walks with me and he talks with me. But that's our mindset. Can we take it somewhere else? Whenever we have this mindset, he is on our level in this place that we are in. In this realm of existence. Oh, I got your attention now, right? We have diminished him in our minds. We have brought him to our level rather than taking up and walking in our birthright in him. We half-heartedly believe that we are seated with him. It has not grafted within our hearts yet. So we battle our minds and continue to walk below our calling. That makes sense, folks. Do we? Is he with us? Yes, he is. But does he want to walk with me right here, or does he want me seated with him? What is more important to him? Walking down here, trudging through the mud with me on my level, or him seated with me in heavenly places? Come on, we're talking the King. He's invited us into his throne room. And we're saying, no, 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 no. Come down to my battlefield. He's saying, no, nah, you should see your battlefield from my perspective. Seated. It's our birthright given to us because of what he did on the cross of Calvary. He earned it. When we worship, are we worshiping in spirit and in truth? Is transformation coming or are we just going through a routine? Are we going through the motion of worship or the process? It's quiet, really, really quiet. Do you know whenever we enter into his courts with praise and thanksgiving, healing should come to us? transformation should come. Whenever we're singing songs, it's really irrelevant. We might get our ears tickled. We might even have a couple of goosebumps once in a while. But that's not transformation. But whenever we're literally in his presence, look at Isaiah. Where was he? In the presence of the Lord. And things changed. He was not, Isaiah was not down here. 
He was with the Lord. He's in the throne room. And all of a sudden, oh my goodness, I can't remain where I am and how I am. That's where we need to enter whenever we're in worship. Whether it's corporately or individually, in our car, in our closet, wherever that is. What is worship? Isn't it us coming into agreement of who he is? And that through that agreement, transformation comes upon us because our eyes get opened. God inhabits the praises of his people, which means God is in the presence of his people when they worship. When one is in the presence of the Lord, it produces change, cleansing, and cleansing. True worship produces change. How, why in the world do we come in here to sing songs? Lord, if, if I come in here and I sing some songs and we get together, we shout and woo woo all this stuff and walk out the same, then what's the, what's the sense? He said, no, come before me and worship, worship, worship. And watch me touch your heart. Watch me start pulling these things out. You ever get there during worship, sister? Where all of a sudden you're in awe, 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 awe. And things start to change. That's what he wants to do for us. Worship is not about us. It's about him. But whenever we're focused on him, healing comes here. Something happens. In a posture of true worship and adoration, the lenses of the eyes of our hearts become open and focused on truth. Truth of the Lord's divine supremacy, splendor, and glory reigning over all. The truth of his never-failing love, mercy, and compassion. That alone has left me crippled sometimes. Whenever he starts just unraveling these things on, on how much he loves this fool. It's like, oh my, it, it doesn't even make sense. It does not compute. But whenever that love starts to come through in truth, the truth of our desperate need of communion with him, as we gaze upon him, all things become clear. The hidden becomes visible and the darkness comes to light. We don't want to go there though, do we? <laughs> Keep the dark the dark. Standard rule of thumb? Are we asking the right questions or are we brave enough to ask the right question? This is, this is what it boils down to. And this is a question I don't even want to ask. Lord, what am I not seeing? Lord, what are my eyes blinded to? that you want to bring to light, that you want to work on, that you want to heal. What, what, what do I not want to see? It's really quiet. Are we brave enough to ask that question? Lord, what am I not seeing in me? Search me, O oh Lord. Are there any blemishes that I am not seeing that can cause decay or hindrance in my life or my testimony of you? Does the depths of my character and being reflect you? That's all he's wanting to do. Is he beautiful? Yes. Guess what? He wants us to be beautiful too. As beautiful as he is, he desires that same beauty in us. Isn't that awesome? Beauty. And he's saying, do you know how beautiful you are? Here, let me show you. Will you put it in my hand and I'm going to show you how beautiful you are. Hollywood can't write a love story as beautiful as the one we're walking through. The Lord is calling us to deeper levels of trust in him. Not only with our provision and direction, but also with the deeper heart issues that are hidden. All the hurts and pains. 
if you were caught in a repetitive cycle in your life, you have not dealt with things that the Lord is wanting to deal with. If you are walking in anger or even resentment, you are not dealing with what the Lord has wanted you to deal with. If I have walls up between me and my brothers and sisters, I have not dealt with everything that the Lord wants me to deal with. It really sucks getting real. But Lord, may you strip the old wineskins from us and fill us with your fresh wine. Help us not to cling on to yesterday's problems and disasters, but to walk in your glory and your majesty. Because Lord, we know whatever you take us through, even those deep things within us, your word says that you're going to go through the fires with us. You will go through the waves and the waters with us. You will go through these things with us. And as long as we have hold of your hand, we are secure. So, Lord, help us to be honest and open with you and allow you to do what you want to do so that you can pour your fresh wine into your bride that we might rise up and be who you've called us to be, walking in all, all of your glory and all of your splendor, displaying your perfect love to a hurt and dying world. He does not simply want you not going to hell. You know, the Lord doesn't want you to go to hell or be destroyed, right? Right? But that's not his only objective. He wants you whole, healthy, and flourishing in all areas of your life. He wants his very nature flourishing within your members and your minds. He wants us thinking as clearly as he thinks. He wants us vibrant, full of life, full of energy. That's how he wants us. He doesn't just not want us to go to hell. I'm not serving him because I don't want to go to hell. It was a concept years ago, but then I grew up. Oh, I want to be with him because he's awesome. And he's saying, you're awesome. That's why he said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you have a weary soul? Let me ask you that. Have you ever had a weary soul? I get a weary soul sometimes. Where you just feel weighted down, you felt burdened. The Lord is saying, come to me. Learn something from me. And I will give you rest for your souls. Rest for your souls. How deep is that? The Lord is calling us to shore up the sides of our heart. He is calling and wooing us to greater levels of trust in him, not only with the superficial things of life, but rather the deep levels of our hearts, a refining and purification. But back to Matthew 11, in, in, this is one, I wanted to grab this. Matthew eleven, twenty-eight 28 through 30. And this is from the message book. 
I just came across it, and I have never quoted a scripture from the message, but I really like the way that this is written, so I'm going to share that with you. It says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you, you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I just thought that it was beautiful the way that was worded. So, the question this morning is, what will I... My goodness, Greg said the same thing this morning, did he not? What will our response be? Anytime the Lord asks us a question, will you come, will you come to me? Anytime. He wants a response. And that response this morning can either be, Yes, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk this with you regardless of how ugly and nasty and horrible this looks. I'm gonna, but I'm going to trust you and walk through this with you or we can do what we always do quite a bit and say, no, Lord, you can't access today. And we say that maybe another day, maybe some other time. Uh, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of healing. I know I, I kind of preached something like this just a few weeks ago. But the water is available. And it, if it breaks my heart, I know it's breaking his heart. Whenever he still sees hurt, he still sees underlying things. Oh my goodness, we can see it on one another. And he sees it, so I know his heart is broken. He said, come dive into the water. Healing is available today. Don't put it off another week. Don't have the preacher preach this message again. Don't have me woo you on this anymore. But come to the altar. Come receive your healing. Come and worship me and be healed. <clears throat> the word says that he pleads through us, does he not? Maybe this is 100% for me. I don't know. But whenever I say, Lord, make me pure before you, before your people. Pure is pure. Pure means, Lord, erase all the spots. Maybe I should be careful what I ask for. He's wanting to take us elsewhere he is wanting us to progress and move forward because body there's greatness setting in this room that he's wanting to use for his glory but it doesn't start until first we go to the master he who enlisted us we go before him for him to equip for him to heal, for him to deliver, because he has work for us to do. And like I said, how it all started, do not give foothold to the enemy. And the enemy knows it. I mean, he watches us, right? He, know, he, he knows the things that we're not dealing with that we need to. And what sparked a lot of this on is the condition of this nation. The spirits, yeah, I'm going to go here, are getting pretty bold. And it's time for us to shore up our hearts and get that protective coating upon us that we cannot be exploded. Exploited, not exploded. We want to be exploded not exploited.
He's wanting to take us deeper. He's wanting us to rise up and be full of the Holy Spirit without any hindrances nor delays. So will we hold him at a distance or will we we yield to his working hand in our lives? Will we go through the motions or will we walk through the process of healing with him? Debbie, you want to jump up on the piano? Or Joey, you want to do something? Or Greg, you want to do something? Arturo. But he is wanting to bring deep healing within us. Even healing that we don't even know we need. I could say, folks, I got blindsided, and I, it was not my intent. I was quite content living in my, obli- my oblivion, blah, blah, blah. But whenever he says, hey, you've been r- r- riding, cruising for a while here. We got some work to do, my son. And I go, who, me? But it's for his benefit. And he's calling each and every one. I don't know what's buried in who. All I know is, is that fiery, burning light coming out of your eyes? Or is there something within us that we still have not released? He does not want his church to go through the motions or run around the same mountains. He wants us going straight up the mountain into his glory cloud. The same invitation that was given to Israel is given to us. You can stay at the base of the mountain or you can come up. The reason they were told not to come up is because he already knew they wouldn't. But he's inviting us up. Greater glory. My beloved, you are fully and completely surrounded by my love. This journey that I ask you to take with me is full of joy, life, and completeness. This is a journey of delight and abundance of the heart. My beauty will radiate over you as you indulge yourself in my presence and allow me to stretch out my hand upon you. My eyes have been fixed upon you, fix yours upon me, and walk in delight. I have called you as my own, I have set you as a seal. I ask you to fully and completely trust in me, for I have great things in store for you. You cannot conceive all that I have placed before you and the places that I will set your feet upon. I choose this day to lift you from where you are and place you above shakable ground. In my might and power, you will be established for my great pleasure. All will see that I am your banner of victory. Hearken this day to my voice and come into my consuming presence. 